the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Mm. So the question is, if you really were or are Jesus, surely all of these events would have happened by now. Well, firstly, uh, the statement is a statement based upon whether the Bible is true or not. And I've already discussed in other, in other questions whether the Bible is true in all of its facets or not. But let's look at this verse more carefully. This verse supposedly was written by Paul mm -hmm. and supposedly um, it was saying, and I say supposedly because Paul himself often didn't write passages that were attributed to him and they were often embellished later um, when Paul's w words were copied. Yeah. So, but, but let's assume for a moment that Paul wrote these words if, if we make that assumption, which I don't feel is a valid assumption and I've spoken to Paul and I know that he didn't write a lot of these words. <laughs> but let's assume that he did for a moment. Basically what Paul's saying here in 1 Thessalonians is that his belief at the time that he was alive was that he would never die. He wouldn't die. He would, he would wait for the Lord, as he calls me, to, to come and he would rise into the air, into the clouds with me. That, that was his, according to this verse, belief system. Now, Paul died and this event never occurred. Yes. So you could basically say this is a false prophecy in the Bible, at least it's a false prophecy in the Bible, because Paul himself believed it to be true and it did not happen. He, believed, he was referring to himself when he said, and us, we who are still alive, and obviously he expected himself to be still alive when I came again. So this was a part of his belief systems and... and, and and it was a part of many of the disciples' belief systems that I would return very rapidly after I died or a few years after I died, I would return again to, to see them all again, not understanding some of my words about when I would see them next. And so what they did is they assumed that when I died, they, I would come back at some point in the future, but it would be in between the time that they would still be alive. And Paul himself assumed that I would be still alive in this verse. Uh, sorry, that yeah. I would come while he was still alive sure. in this verse. Now, obviously that never happened. I did not return to the earth while Paul was alive. So this never happened. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is an event that was foretold during, to happen during Paul's lifetime and it never occurred. Now, many Christians then make interpretations of the event saying, oh, Paul wasn't really referring to himself here when he said we, he was using some kind of royal we yeah. that meant some people in the future and so forth. But this is all now just interpretation. It's not the actual words that were spoken and it's interpretation to meet a teaching or a belief that people have about what the potential would be when I returned. So, so again, it's not very logical to assume these particular things. It is very clear here that whoever wrote these words, and let's assume that it's Paul, whoever wrote these words believed himself to, re, to be remaining alive until I came again. And quite obviously, I did not come while he was alive. Mm -hmm. So therefore, his belief was false. Now, it is his belief, so I'm not saying that it's not the belief of the writer of the book, but his belief was false. It was something that never happened. And this is how I feel it is for a lot of Christians and their belief systems. They believe things based upon the words of other people who believe things that never happened in their lifetime. 
and they're still continuing to hope, still continuing to hope in the, that some point in the future these events would occur. This is exactly the same as what happened with me with the Jews in the first century. They, I came as the Messiah to earth. They did not recognise me as the Messiah at that time. And so they continually, even to this day, wait for another Messiah to come. Mm -hmm. Because the person who was the Messiah came and they did not recognise him. And also they did not believe what he was saying to be true. And so now they have now waited an additional 2,000 years for the Messiah to come. And he's now come the second time and, he still ha and they still haven't been able to recognise that he's come. And so I feel what the Christians are doing here is they are doing the same things with their interpretations of the Bible as what the Jews did in the first century. Exactly the same thing. They interpret what they believe the Messiah should be. And in the Christian's case, they interpret what they believe Jesus will be. And then they place their interpretations upon the analysis of the person who's claiming to be Jesus. In the first case, the Jews put the interpretation upon a person, myself, who was claiming to be the Messiah. They see, saw that I did not measure up mm -hmm. to such claims that was, were contained in their written word. And so then they claimed that I couldn't be the Messiah. And nowadays the Christians claim that I can't be Jesus because I don't meet their requirements. It's almost a mirror identical situation in the first century and now that's happening with these particular things. Mm -hmm. Now, many of these things are never going to happen. This is called the rapture. It's often referred to as the rapture in Christian theology. It is never going to happen. Never. So please understand, any of you Christians out there who believe in this verse, this is never going to happen. I am never going to come to earth in this way. I have already chosen the way in which I'm coming to earth. And the way, by the way, wasn't chosen by myself, but it was chosen by God in the sense that God's laws dictate to me what way I can return. And I have a number of choices about how I can return. Now, I could have returned in this manner, but of course, this manner would teach nothing and would actually cause people to have a lot of fear and other emotions that would be totally unnecessary for their future experience. I do not want to come back to earth in this manner, and so I choose to come to earth in a different manner. Quite simple. I also was not going to come in terms of just to save the righteous. In fact, quite categorically, the Bible itself demonstrates in the first century that I came to speak to people who were sinners as well as who were righteous. And in this, world, in this life, I am doing exactly the same thing. My character has not changed. My character is not different from what it was in the first century. It has not changed. So these verses will never be fulfilled because I choose to not fulfill them. So just because the Bible says that they are true, they are just the beliefs of people who purported to be my followers after my death, who wrote down the words, hoping in their hope that I would do these things. And I am not going to do those things. So um, mm. you're very clear that you're not going to do these things. No. Can you tell us why you would never come down um, and with the voice of an archangel and um, do all these things with those who are alive and those who are dead? And all, why, why are you so clear that even if you could, this is something that you would never do? Well, firstly, God's laws preclude me from doing many of the things that the Bible claims I should do on my return. For, for example, the Bible claims that I should be particip a participant and, in fact, the leader of a genocide of all of the people who do not believe in myself. Now, now that's the same as Stalin wanting to commit a genocide of all the people who do not want to accept his rule in Russia. And it's the same as Hitler having a genocide of the Jews, all the people who he disapproved of or disagreed with. We know that any person who's in a condition of love would never do these things. Now, God's laws preclude me from doing these things. If I wish to maintain a relationship with God, I would never be able to do some of these things that are claimed or the Bible claims that I will do. So, so that alone precludes me from acting in the manner the Bible states. In addition, there is also my own will involved. What do I want to achieve on my return? 
is the, is, is the question. Now, many Christians have, have a whole set of things that they want me to achieve. Many of these things they want me to achieve are completely out of harmony with love. For example, one thing that many Christians want me to do is to destroy any person who's not a believer. Now, I do not want to destroy any person who's not a believer. I want to help them by answering their questions, become a believer if they wish to. That's what I would like to do instead mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. I am never going to engage uh, doing something just because a group of people who purport to be my followers want me to do it. I'm never going to do something that's out of harmony with love. So I can't act because of those reasons. Then in addition to that, there's also what are my personal desires? Well, my personal desires have nothing to do with coming on a cloud and doing some kind of show-offy thing in order to prove to everybody that what I'm, what I'm talking about God is true. I don't want to do those things. I would like people to be motivated to have a relationship with God through their heart, not through some kind of external demonstration of my power and glory so that they feel like impelled by this external demonstration to have some faith. I would like them to demonstrate faith in my teachings without me having to go through all of that rigmarole mm -hmm. of having all of these outward displays of you know, power and glory and, other, and otherwise. I'm not saying that at some point in the future there might not be things that I do that will help people dem clearly develop their faith, mm -hmm. but what I am saying is that it is not, I, I, it's not something that I, that I feel is of primary importance to me to come in that manner. In fact, coming in this manner uh, that is portrayed in the Bible to me, it feels quite negative, in fact. And in fact, if, if a person, and, and we'll discuss this in another FAQ, if a person believes that I, I'm going to come to destroy the wicked and I'm going to come to become a ruler, then I don't have any desire to be a ruler. I don't have any desire to destroy anybody. I don't have any desire to force people to do anything. God doesn't either, actually. <laughs> you know? So why would people believe why would people want to cling to this verse then? What would be the investment in continuing to believe this? Well, I feel there are many emotional investments which I have a lot of uh, compassion for uh, of a person wanting to believe such a verse. You see, many, many people who have done good or believe themselves to have done good while they're on earth are looking for a reward for their doing of good. They don't understand that there's, an auto there's automatic rewards that are happening in their soul and automatic rewards that happen after their death. That, that far exceed their current expectations. So they want some kind of delineation, if you like, between the people who are doing good and the people who are doing bad. They also want, to, because of their anger and rage, they want to punish the people who are doing bad. They have some emotional investment in God being a punishing God. Mm -hmm. God is not a punishing God. Like God is never going to be a punishing God. God doesn't need to be a punishing God because God's laws control the universe perfectly and there's no need to punish anybody. God's laws are corrective and not punitive. Mm -hmm. So God's laws are all created to correct people and not to punitively punish them. And, and so, you know, I feel there's deep misunderstandings about the nature of God and deep misunderstandings about my own nature that cause people to wish to believe in these verses. But also, there are deep misunderstandings about the actual unloving emotions that exist in the individual. Mm. An individual who wishes to believe that I'm coming to punish somebody or to, to kill them or destroy them, obviously has some emotions inside of themselves where they would like the wicked to be punished and destroyed. And, and this is not what God likes, and it's not what I like. And it's quite clear from my first century life that I, that I did not want this. It's quite clear from what I said about God in my first century life that God doesn't want this. And yet, and yet the Bible has contradictory statements to those things that I, that I stated, actually stated in the first century and that, and that my character displayed. So basically you're saying this Thessalonians, the first Thessalonians quote that we referred to is actually demonstrating a punishing, if it were to be true, it would mean that you yourself and God had a punishing attitude to people who were not... Well, not specifically this verse, because this verse specifically is referring to what is classified as the rapture, and the rapture is, a, is, this, con is this concept that God is going to come, or Jesus is going to come, and take all of the people that are on earth that are his believers up to him, and then who knows what's going to happen on earth after that. Now, there are verses in the Bible, in Peter, for example, that would tend to suggest that the earth is going to be destroyed by fire. You know, and, and many Christians do believe that. Mm -hmm. Some believe that's symbolical in that the earth will just be 
you know, no longer have truth available on it. And so everything on earth will be terrible yeah. or, or something like that. So, so there are many contrary belief systems amongst Christians. That's why there's so many Christian denominations. They all have different belief systems about what the Bible actually says. Yeah. But uh, this verse is used in conjunction with these other verses to demonstrate the entirety of the events that would occur at the time of my coming. Yeah. And basically Christians are saying because they have not been raptured, you know, they have not been called to heaven yet, I can't be Jesus. Yeah. And it's totally illogical to make such a statement. The rapture is never going to occur. In the future, never going to occur. It's an event, trust me, there'll be Christians in 100 years' time still waiting for this, and then in 1,000 years' time still waiting for this potentially, and it's never going to happen, right? Just as a lot of the things that the disciples and apostles believed in the first century would occur after my death never occurred. Hmm. And, and we need to come face to face with the fact that we want them to occur for a reason. And we need to examine whether our reasons for, the, for us wanting these things to occur are pure or whether they're based on some very dark emotions, based on wanting to punish or harm other people. And for the majority of people, there are dark emotions in them. And that's why I said in the, in the first century, and it is quoted in the Bible, again, not as accurately as it could be, but... I said similar to this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in the heaven. Many will say to me on that day, and this is the day they enter into the spirit world, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Get away from me, you evildoers. Now the question that has to be asked is why would people who claim that I am their Lord or claim that I am their, you know, saviour in some way, and who claim that they have been doing everything God wants, why would I be calling them evildoers? And the answer is quite plain. Because even though they had these sets of belief systems, their emotions and their actions were unloving. And they did evil while they were purporting to be truthful. And if you look at historically at the Christian faith, we can see there are many times in human history where the Christian faith became very evil and very black in terms of its dominant emotions uh, regarding you know, what it was ready and willing to do mm. in order to, to hurt and harm other people. You look through the Dark Ages, the, the Spanish Inquisition, all actions taken by the church, the so-called church of God, the so-called my church, all actions which I must condemn as evil and and these people were all waiting for me to come through their lifetime and I never came through their lifetime and I will, in the manner in which they expected. Mm. Now, now, to me, these verses should give Christians some pause and cause them to reflect. What is really important is the development of love inside of the soul. That is the thing of importance, not the belief system about my coming. Every time you attack me about the belief system you have about my coming, you are demonstrating the lack of love in your soul. This lack of love is what's going to determine your future location in the spirit world. Yeah. It's not going to be determined by your desire to be in a certain location and it's not going to be determined by the fact that you believe Jesus of the Bible. It's going to be determined by how much love you have in your soul. Now, many Christians nowadays are starting to get that, I feel, Many Christians now, you see on forums and so forth, many Christians are starting to actually consider, is the Bible, is the God Bible portrays mm -hmm. the real personality and characteristics of God? Because and many if, of them can see it's not. Because if we look at the Bible in its <coughs> entirety, it carries a lot of... Um, uh, contradictions about the nature of God, doesn't it? Yes, on one it? hand on one it hand. says that God is loving and perfect and on the other hand it says he's a genocidal maniac who killed millions and millions of people at the same time. Yeah. And, and which one is he? Now, most Christians would argue with he's both. Mm. Well, I, I can't agree. You know, the, the whole concept that, that a loving person would kill other people is flawed. That's why I said in the first century, you must love your neighbour as you say, and you must love your enemy. You know, what's the benefit of just loving your friend? Love your enemy. Like, mm. if you love your enemy, you won't want to kill your enemy. Now, if God loves his enemies, God won't want to kill them. God will want to help them change. Yeah. This is how I am. This is how God is. Any verse that reads differently is 
obviously not the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it comes from the Bible or not is immaterial. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the truth. It's interesting, though, that even the Koran has very similar verses. Any person that does not follow their practice, the, the Muslim practices, you know, follow Muhammad and his teachings, will be condemned under the same verses that the Bible condemns any person not following Christian practices. Now, this is an indication that, that none of them are right and that all of them have flaws in that when they state that God will destroy the wicked, they are completely out of harmony with love. God will not destroy anyone. I will not destroy anyone. Muhammad, if he was in a loving state, would never want to destroy anyone. And so, so, so none of the destruction of these wicked, so-called wicked uh, is, is ever going to occur. What will occur is they will be corrected. Mm -hmm. They will be corrected in time through the laws of God. The laws of God are perfect. Correction will automatically occur. And it won't. Ha and you're saying it won't happen in one moment, in one hour, in one day. No. That it's already happening. Every or? moment is really a judgment day or a judgment moment for ourselves and our choices that we make. Every time we do something, the immediate, the immediately we do it that's out of harmony with love. There's an immediate penalty on our soul given not by God but by the laws that God has created that we will have to compensate for at some point in the future. And the same applies to all the good things we do. There is an immediate benefit to our soul, an immediate benefit to the soul of others and an immediate you know, gift that God gives us as a result that we will reap at some point in the future. You will reap what you sow at some point in the future. These are all true principles that are stated in the Bible. Um, you know, about, about our future and mm -hmm. how, uh, how God will react to our life. Mm -hmm. But if we believe that there's going to be some kind of day when Jesus comes, destroys all the wicked, keeps all the righteous with him or, or takes all the righteous to be with him, then we're going to be severely disappointed because that will never happen in the future. It's not happened in the past. All of the disciples who believed it in the past, for 2,000 years it has not happened and it's not going to happen in the future either because it cannot happen. It cannot happen and God and myself be in a state of love. Yeah. It can only happen if God was like the devil is supposedly and it could only happen if I was like someone like Stalin or Hitler. That's the only way it could happen and we're certainly not like that. God's not like that and I'm not like that either. Mm. Thank you.